see from Hagersville. Hagerstown. Hagerstown. I knew I'd, I knew I'd mess it up. Yeah. Well, now, just a second. I haven't said anything yet. All right. I'm glad this is the only chairman that hadn't run off and left the speaker up here by himself or herself. You got a lot of courage, Dale. Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Jack Quarterman, and I am an alcoholic. I am uh, very happy uh, to be here. I, I don't know that I've ever experienced hospitality quite like I've experienced over the past couple of days. And uh, I weighed 195 pounds when I weighed, arrived here just two days ago, and now <laughs> I've uh, I picked up a couple pounds, but I still have some room for a little more jambalaya. Uh, I am from Hagerstown, Maryland, and I am a member of the very cleverly named Hagerstown Group of Alcoholics Anonymous. We are the third oldest group in the state of Maryland, and when uh, when they were naming groups in Maryland back then, some 62 years ago, uh, they didn't know this thing was going to catch on, and uh, otherwise we'd have picked a different name. But uh, So we're just the Hagerstown Group, and... Uh, we meet on Mondays, Thursdays, and Saturdays in Hagerstown, and if I'm in Hagerstown, that's where you'll find me on Mondays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. I'm a member in good standing of my home group, and by that I mean I have a sponsor, my sponsor has a sponsor, I sponsor people. I attend meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous on a regular basis, and uh, I have a service position with my home group. Currently, I'm our GSR. I think uh, you need to know that I am not a spokesperson for Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, nor am I an expert on Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm just somebody who's been invited here to share with you my experience, strength, and hope. Um, Lydia asked uh, you all if you had a cell phone uh, to turn them off, but if you're an alcoholic like I am, I hate being told what to do, and I generally do the opposite thing. So if you got a cell phone here with you tonight, well, by all means, take that puppy out and turn it on, okay? But if you would, put it on vibrate, and that way you can enjoy your incoming call and you won't disturb the rest of us. I, um, I uh, called my mom uh, before I came, uh, came down here this evening. My mother is 92 years old. She was married to my alcoholic father for 30 years. And as a result of that, she knows what an alcoholic is. And she's amazed when I call her like I did this evening and reminded her that I was out of town and I told her where I was. And she said, are you down there to do one of those AA things? I said, I am, Mom. She says, you make sure you tell those people that you are not an alcoholic. And uh, I want to believe my mom. And actually, I ought to start listening to her, don't you think, uh, after all this time? Um, there's a lot of confusion about whether I'm an alcoholic or not, quite frankly, because I've, I've discovered here in Alcoholics Anonymous that I lack many of those things that have great cachet in Alcoholics Anonymous that uh, many people have which I don't have. Like, I've never been to prison. And I've never been to jail, never been to a treatment center or a halfway house. I've never been arrested, never had a DWI, DUI, or an alcohol-related offense. I spoke to my wife this evening before coming here. If I don't screw this thing up, she and I are going to be married 41 years come August. And... Uh, Yeah, you all are probably going to want to give her a chip for that after you hear this lead. Um, you're going to find out she's been married for 41 years. I've had some momentary lapses along the way. 
I've never lost a job uh, because of uh, drinking. Uh, as I said, I don't have any multiple marriages, don't have any children born out of wedlock. I don't even have a good tattoo. So you're probably asking yourself, why did they invite this guy to come here tonight? That's a good question. You know, we've heard some terrific speakers last night and today, and you're going to hear another one tomorrow. I think four out of five is not bad. I really, I think it's okay. I think it's important. I want to thank the committee for uh, for invi- allowing Joe to invite me to come here this evening. I think it's real important that you know who is responsible for my being here. Because if I say anything in the next two and a half hours while we're together that offends you in any way, I want you to take that up with Joe because it's his responsibility that I'm here. If I say anything that you like, well, by all means, come up and tell me because I like those attaboys. Uh, I'm going to put my watch up here, not so much because I can see it or I pay any attention to it, but I just think it gives hope to the newcomer, you know. Uh, could I could I see the hands of those folks who are here tonight or in their four, first four months of uh, sobriety? First four months? All right. Okay, great. Great, thank you. All right. Good. Well, welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. That's where you are, you know. Yes, it's come to this. <laughs> How did a hip, slick, cool guy like me end up in Alcoholics Anonymous? I This was not on my list of things to do when I went to see my guidance counselor in junior high school, I tell you that. Well, let me say this to you. If you're new here in Alcoholics Anonymous, we know a lot about you already. Like, we know that 2007 has been a lousy year for you boys and girls. Nobody gets here on a winning streak. But the fact that you're here is very important. You're here, so why not stay here? In the time that I've been in Alcoholics Anonymous, if I've not learned anything else, I have learned that there is absolutely nothing here that will harm me. Any pain that I've ever experienced in Alcoholics Anonymous has been a direct result of my resistance to the program of recovery of Alcoholics Anonymous. There's never been anything that I have done here and following the directions of the program that has hurt me one little bit. It's always been my insistence on doing things my way and crashing and burning one more time. So if you're new here or you're coming back here, by all means, please, I beg you to just stay here. No matter what the voices in your head tell you, stay here. And slowly, over time, the... the, the, the squirrel in the cage, the hamster in the cage will slow down. The grand central thinking, thoughts in and out, in and out, in and out will slow down. And just like the provinces say, we begin to experience and know peace. I, um, I'm going to try to tell you in a general way what I used to be like, what happened, and what I'm like now. Uh, I can start off by saying that... Uh, I was a liar, a cheat, and a thief, and a user, abuser of people, places, and things, and I allowed myself to be thoughtlessly overserved from time to time. And then I stopped drinking, and I was a liar, a cheat, and a thief, and a user, abuser of people, places, and things. Uh, You know what they say about when you sober up a horse thief? What do you got? You got a horse thief. He's just not drinking. And uh, but a little more detail in that. um, I. uh, I began drinking uh, when I was about 14. I understand that's a little late uh, by some standards, uh, but that's when I began drinking. But I am absolutely assured that it did for me exactly what it did for Dick and exactly what it did for Deb. It changed my entire perception on life. It was, in fact, the elixir of life. It was the answer to all of my concerns and prayers. I could have used a drink in kindergarten because I wouldn't share, I wouldn't eat the cookie, and I wouldn't drink the milk. So I could have used a drink then. But I started when I was 14. I liked what it did for me. I liked what it did to me. And I wanted to do it again as soon as I could, as much as I could, as often as I could. And alcohol began to play a central and vital role in my life. 
I would like to tell you that alcohol did not harm me at all when I was in high school. It was drinking with no problems. But I would have to tell you, in all honesty, I spent five years in high school. Um, I'd like to tell you that it's because I wanted to have a solid academic foundation before I moved on to higher education. But in point of fact, drinking interfered a great deal with my life, and it caused me to spend five years in high school. Um, when I got out of high school, I went to a community college in Hagerstown, and while well, going to that community college, a good friend of mine and I, uh, one summer, uh, we decided that we were going to take a road trip, and we were going to drive from Hagerstown, Maryland, to California. And so we got everything you need for such a trip. We each packed an overnight bag. We got 12 cases of beer, put them in the back of the car, and we were ready to set out on Friday. But Thursday night, Bill's father told him that he could not go. Now, here I am with 12 cases of beer and an overnight bag, and I'm not driving to California by myself, I'll tell you that. I'd quit my job at the drugstore. I did have a pocket full of money. What is a fellow to do? Well, if you know anything about Maryland, you know we got a little, little sliver of land on our eastern border, which is on the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, there's a resort there called Ocean City, Maryland, and that's where I went, to Ocean City, Maryland. I uh, went to Ocean City, and I stayed there for a month. I lived there as a bum. Uh, I lived in the basement of hotels. I had friends who... Uh, who were bellhops and uh, waiters and waitresses, and they uh, sometimes they'd put me in rooms that were vacant, and otherwise I'd stay down in the basement. I would go to restaurants and eat leftover restaurant food, half a lobster tail, an uneaten crab cake. So I didn't have to worry about room or board. All I had to do was drink my 12 cases of beer, and then I had that pocket full of money to buy more beer. So I had a very good month uh, in Ocean City that month. Uh, I had so much fun there, I decided I wanted to work in Ocean City. But I'm a keen observer of my surroundings. And uh, I saw that if you were a lifeguard or a beach boy or a waiter or a waitress, a bartender, a clerk, it really didn't make any difference. If you drank like I drank and acted like I acted over a period of a summer, there was a real good chance you were going to get arrested. I didn't want to get arrested. And I noticed there was one group of people working in Ocean City who did not get arrested. And those were the members of the Ocean City Police Department. So I became a police officer. Um, the first year that I was a police officer in Ocean City, they gave me a boardwalk beat. Uh, it was 9th Street, where all the... Uh, Nightclubs were located. It was an excellent, uh, excellent location for me. I'd probably been a police officer nine, for nine or ten days when it became apparent that I have a, a very, uh, very unique trait uh, for an officer, and that is I can spot an underage drinker from a hundred yards away. And so I would approach these folks on the boardwalk. I would establish that indeed they were underage. I would ask them what they had in the cooler. Uh, they would tell me they had Coca-Cola and tuna fish. I would ask if maybe we could look in the cooler. Absolutely, officer. They'd open the lid of the cooler. There would be the Coca-Cola in nice, even row across in the ice. There would be a little container of uh, tuna fish and some bread. But then I would reach way down into the bottom of that cooler, and I'd come up with a can of Budweiser. And the whole thing would change then. Because you see, your life as you have known it has just ended. You are in the possession of alcohol and you are underage. I am about to arrest you. You think you're going to college, but you are not going to college. You are going to jail. I'm going to take you to jail. I understand you are hoping to go into the military. The military will not want you. You are going to jail. As a matter of fact, at 3 a.m. tomorrow morning, I'm going to call your parents back in Baltimore, and I'm going to tell them that they got to come down here and bail your sorry ass out of jail. You want to offer an alternative? What kind of alternative do you have in mind? 
confiscate the beer? You do understand if I confiscate the beer, I'm going to have to take the cooler, and if I take the cooler, I'm going to take the Coca-Cola and the tuna fish. That's okay with you? Okay. I'm going to write your name in my official Ocean City Police log. And don't you ever, ever do this in Ocean City again. You are free to go. Now, i got to tell you, it's hard to walk a beat when you're dragging a cooler full of beer around behind you. So I had to work out a deal with my lieutenant and my sergeant that as I collected these coolers full of beer, they would come and pick them up in their squad car, and then at the end of the shift, I would give them any wine or whiskey that I had acquired, and I got the coolers and I got the beer. Now, if you were a friend of mine in Ocean City, I had the finest collection of coolers on the eastern shore. If you needed a cooler, you could come by and see me. I'd let you have a cooler for a very reasonable price, and you did not have to return it. We had that many coolers. I had a good summer that summer. I didn't uh, buy anything to drink all summer. I drank every day, and I didn't get arrested. And that's my definition of a good summer. I had such a good summer, I went back for a second year. Second year, they gave me a squad car. Lights and sirens, the whole deal. You can do a lot with a squad car. It was one of those big old LTDs, had those uh, had those big old trunks. You could get like three bodies or five coolers in the trunks of one of those puppies. And I'd go out there on a the beach highway, and I would do my thing. And at the end of the shift, the sergeant and the lieutenant would come to me, and I would give them the whiskey and the wine, and I would take the coolers and the beer. I had another great summer. I drank every day. I didn't buy anything to drink, and I did not get arrested. I'm enjoying my summers in Ocean City. I went back for a third year. Now, I'm about to tell you an event that happened in the third year of my police experience, which changed the course of my life. You may have one of these benchmarks experiences in your life. I don't know. It was 3 o'clock in the morning. I was on the beach highway. I stopped a car for drunk driving. The driver was obviously drunk. I got him out of the car. I was writing up the ticket. He says to me, you don't know who I am, do you, officer? And I said, no, I don't. He said, well, I am the state's attorney for Worcester County, the county you're standing in right now. Now, I'm a college kid. I have no idea what a state's attorney is. I have no idea what a state's attorney does. I've never heard of a state's attorney before. So I said, well, good for you. Sign the ticket. So he signed the ticket. There was a fellow there who seemed to be sober. I let him drive, and off they went. Eight o'clock that morning, I pulled into the police department in Ocean City, got out of my cruiser, and as I stepped out, the chief of police was there on the parking lot, and he said, Quarterman, he says, uh, come up to my office and bring that uniform citation book with you. Well, these were the first words the chief had said to me all summer. It looked to me like I was about to get uh, some uh, long overdue commendations for a job well done. So I got my uh, ticket book and went up to his office. And much to my surprise, when I got to the office, seated right inside the door on the couch, was the guy I gave the ticket to at 3 o'clock in the morning. The chief said, give me that ticket book. I handed it to the chief. The chief opened it up to the ticket. He handed the book to the guy sitting on the couch. The guy on the couch reached inside of his coat. He pulled out a pen, and he wrote across the face of that ticket, Case Dismissed, and signed his name. It was at that moment I decided that I wanted to be a lawyer, and if I could be one of those state's attorneys, I definitely wanted to be a state's attorney because the power, the ability to dismiss traffic charges with a stroke of a pen was going to come in mighty handy if you drank like I drank. So I went to law school. Uh, law school interfered with my drinking. There are a lot of smart people in law school. I was not one of them, and so I had to limit myself to drinking on weekends only. But I did graduate from law school, and uh, I had met my wife, and we had married. And uh, we went uh, back to my hometown, Hagerstown, where I began to practice law. I'd only been there about six or eight weeks, and I became aware of the fact that there was a vacancy for an assistant state's attorney in our state's attorney's office. So I went right over there. 
And I said, here I am, sign me up. When do you want me to get, begin work? Now, what I'm about to tell you is what I think I heard them say. Uh, I don't know about you, but there, there's something wrong. I don't know if it has something to do with being an alcoholic or not, but I frequently hear things that are not said. And I see things that never happened. Uh, my sister, who grew up in the same alcoholic home that I grew up in, corrects me frequently. When I tell her about something that I thought happened in our home, she tells me, Jack, that never happened. They never said that. They never did that. So what I'm about to tell you is what I think I heard them say. What? Are you some kind of an idiot? You just got out of law school. You've never been in a courtroom. You've never tried a case. You've never interviewed a witness. You've never picked a jury. You've never made an opening statement or a closing argument. We don't have any time to train you. Get out of the office. That's what I thought I heard them say. Upon reflection and truth, I believe they said, the position's been filled. But I heard what I heard, and I was hurt. I'm a very sensitive person, and I don't suffer well. And I left there with a resentment. I know now it was a resentment. And in uh, Washington County, Maryland, like here, we elect our prosecutors. I went out and found a lawyer who wanted to be state's attorney. I ran his campaign for state's attorney. He got elected state's attorney, and he made me deputy state's attorney. So when I got into that state's attorney's office, I noticed a serious deficiency. We didn't have any badges, and there's no point in being a state's attorney if you don't have a badge. So I designed a very fine badge, and with the badge comes a badge case, and with the badge case, there's a little clear glassine place where you put your driver's license. So when they pull you over and come up and ask to see that license and registration, and you open up that badge case, they don't look to see that driver's license. They look at that badge. Oh, the badge officer? Deputy State's Attorney, Washington County. Oh, no, sir. No, sir. I've only got a couple more miles to go. Yes, sir. I will hold it down. Yes, sir. Oh, listen, officer, I understand you're just doing your duty. Yes, sir. Appreciate your appreciate the professional courtesy. Thank you so much, officer. Yes, you have a nice night, too, sir. Thank you. Now, you're probably getting a little insight into why I've never been arrested or had an alcohol-related offense. But it gets better. The... Uh, we only have uh, two circuit court judges at that time in our community. And my boss, the state's attorney, was about to get appointed circuit court judge. And if he got to be circuit court judge, I was going to be state's attorney. I was excited. I don't know. Well, I do know. I know here in Louisiana, funny things happen in politics. Well, they do in Maryland also. And our state senator stuck his nose in where it didn't belong. He screwed the thing all up. Somebody else got appointed judge, and my friend did not get appointed judge. And I was upset. I wasn't so much upset that my friend didn't get appointed judge. I mean, I was sorry for him. But I was very upset that I didn't get to be state's attorney. Now, I may not be much, but I'm all I think about. And so... I was uh, offended, I was angered, I had a resentment. One night, uh, while having a few adult beverages with some like-minded individuals, we came to the conclusion that somebody ought to teach that state senator a lesson. Somebody needed to run against him in the next election, so I ran for the state senate. Now, I didn't know that the state senator was going to leave his wife and children and run off with the secretary of the Appropriations Committee and move to Florida, but he did. And I got elected state senator. Now, in Maryland, when you get elected state senator, they give you a license plate, and that license plate says, State Senator. Now, this is an aid to efficient law enforcement. That means when they come up behind you on the interstate and they got those overheads going and they get close enough to see that license plate, they turn those overheads off. They come up alongside your car, they turn that interior dome light on, and they toot the horn. Beep, beep. Hi, Senator. Hi, Trooper. 
Hold it down, Senator. Okay, Trooper. And in that way, you don't have a lot of state police tied up with members of the Senate and the House of Delegates on the side of the road when they could be out arresting real criminals. So that guy who got that job as circuit court judge, he didn't like it. And while I was still a state senator, he resigned. So I went over to see the governor. I said, Governor, I'd like you to appoint my friend, the state's attorney, circuit court judge. And the governor said, No, we're not going to be doing that because uh, I'm still smarting from all that adverse publicity over that last appointment up there in Hagerstown. So I am not appointing your guy circuit court judge. However, if you'd like to be circuit court judge, I'll appoint you. Well, there's only two of them, and it's a 15-year term, so I became a circuit court judge. That's frightening, isn't it? <laughs> now, keep it in mind, I'm drinking alcoholically all through this thing. Give you an example of my, my social drinking. The um, Bar Association was having a... Uh, was having a continuing legal education program on the prosecution and defense of drunk driving, and the prosecutor was going to put on what he plans to do when they put on their case, and the defense bar was going to put on their goals and objectives, and Sergeant Long was there with his breathalyzer, and they needed a volunteer to drink the beer and to blow into the breathalyzer, somebody who was fair, impartial, unbiased, somebody who was willing to do it. So I volunteered. And they brought out six beers all iced down in a nice tray. And I said to the guy, I said, what's that? He says, this is the beer for tonight's program. I said, you do realize that this is a two-hour program, and you've only brought out six beers. Oh, he said, we have more beer in the back. I said, you better ice up six more and bring them out because these aren't going to last long. And so they fired up that breathalyzer, and I commenced the drinking, and they commenced to talking, and every 15 minutes I'd blow into that breathalyzer, and yeah, you start off with a .04, bump that up to .09, .14, .19, .20, .21, .22, .23, .24, .25, .26, .27, .28, .29, .30, .31, .32, .33, .34, .35, .36, .37, .38, .39, .40, .41, .42, .43, .44, .45, .46, .47, .48, .49,
And I'd take a pull on it, you know, and pfft, ha, whoo, that's good stuff. And you know how sometimes when you have folks over for a barbecue or a cookout or play some poker or whatever, and you're cleaning up afterwards and you're picking up the cans, and why, this one's got a little something in it. <laughs> what was that? Mm. Oh, cigarette butt. Yep, you're right. Yeah, I know. There's some cigarette butt drinkers in here. I know. Uh, Yes, there, okay, I see you back there, okay. I loved everything about drinking. I loved the stemware, I loved everything about it. And my beverage of choice was Jack Daniels Black Label and crushed ice with a twist of lemon. That was to die for, as far as I was concerned. That was the most marvelous thing. Although I did, I did have a, a little love affair with the gin martini. And, uh, but I got to tell you, I had a bad gin experience one time, and even to this day, it's hard for me to go into a pine forest. It just is. So um, it was sad. But um, it is with some degree of embarrassment that I stand before you here this evening to tell you that my last drink of beverage alcohol was um, Tia Maria. Oh, I know. How do you think I feel? It's embarrassing. It is. It's embarrassing. There's some people in here I know are going, what in the heck is Tia Maria? Well, let me tell you, you don't want to know. Whatever you do, if you're planning on going back out there, do not order Tia Maria for your relapse. Don't do it. I got to tell you, though, in my own defense, I think it's important that you know that this last drink that I had of Tia Maria came from a tainted bottle. And the reason I know it was a tainted bottle is because I got sick on the way home. And getting sick while driving home was not part of my drinking experience. I understand that getting sick is part of the drinking experience. I mean, if I'm down there at the broad axe shooting pool and playing shuffleboard and it gets to be 10, 11 o'clock at night and I'm getting a little full, I go out back behind the dumpster and I throw up and I come back and I keep on drinking to closing time. That is part of drinking. I understand that. Or Saturday or Sunday morning, while on my knees hugging that porcelain altar that many of us have in our homes, after a good Friday or Saturday night, that is part of drinking, and I'm willing to pay that price. But throwing up on the way home was not part of my experience. And by the way, anybody in here find anything quite to match the feeling of cool porcelain on a fevered brow? head laying on that toilet. Oh, man. I never found anything that felt that comforting. <laughs> Woo! So I got sick on my way home. Now, my wife is an elementary school teacher, and I don't know how it is in Louisiana, but in Maryland, elementary school children are germ-infested. And the teachers get those germs, and they bring the germs home, and then the relatives of the teachers get sick. And I got up the next morning, I had flu. I could not believe it. Flu. I just couldn't believe it. But we go, I went to work. I went to work. And uh, that was on Thursday, and Friday was Good Friday, so I didn't have to work on Good Friday. And I got that upset stomach that frequently comes with flu. I had that on Friday. Saturday... Saturday before Easter, I started to develop that lower tract distress that you get with flu. And uh, when you get that lower tract distress uh, combined with that upset stomach thing, that will hone your decision-making down to a really fine edge. It really will, because you don't know whether to sit or kneel or kneel or sit. And at least on one occasion, my wife tells me that weekend I made the wrong decision. And if she was here, you could talk to her about that. But she's not, and I'm going on. So... Uh, I ended up in the hospital on Monday uh, because uh, I was so uh, dehydrated from all that kneeling and sitting that I'd been doing over the weekend. And uh, that night my abdomen became distended and they performed an emergency laparotomy on me and they found that I was full of peritonitis. I had gangrene in my abdomen. I truly think it was the result of busting the gut from all that uh all that upset stomach thing, but they never did determine why I had peritonitis and then my, uh, my pancreas was digesting itself, my liver was out of whack, my kidneys quit, and my respiratory system failed. So um, things were not looking good for the home team. 
and I went into intensive care. I was in intensive care in Hagerstown for three weeks when uh, they announced that they were sending me to Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore. Now, I thought this was a good thing uh, because I knew people had gone to Johns Hopkins and they had lived, and I also knew people had gone to the Washington County Hospital and they had died. So I was encouraged. But they told my wife they were sending me to Johns Hopkins to die because they didn't, they weren't able to diagnose what was wrong with me. They didn't think Johns Hopkins could do anything for me. But if there was any hope of my survival, they were sending me there, but they truly thought I was going to die. I'm really glad they didn't tell me that because I'd have been discouraged by that. But I can tell you this, that, uh, that on, uh, this day, May the 5th of uh, 1982, I was in my fifth, fourth, my fourth week of intensive care, uh, my first full week at Johns Hopkins Hospital. And so if you ask me if I'm having a good day today, all I have to think about is where I was 25 years ago. And, you know, I'm having a darn good day today. I know the difference between a good day and a bad day. I may complain every now and then about a day because I'm a human being. I get to complain a little bit. But I really, I, you know, the way it was on uh, 25 years ago today, uh-uh. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go back there for anything. Now, I, I've heard a lot of people say that their worst day sober sure beat their best day drunk, and that's my experience. I just find that this way of life is a lot easier way to live than the way I lived back then. But um, at the end of my second week at Johns Hopkins, the doctors came to me and said they didn't know what else to do for me. So they were going to give me a day of rest the next day. The next day was May the 14th. That was my belly button birthday. I turned 40 in the Johns Hopkins Hospital on May 14th. Uh, within the next two weeks, my kidney functions returned. I was off the respirator. My liver functions came back. My uh, pancreas stopped digesting itself. And on May the 28th, I was discharged from the Johns Hopkins Hospital. They were not able to diagnose what was wrong with me. They presented me to the internal medicine department. They could not get a majority vote. Uh, it's been my position that it's much better to survive an undiagnosed illness than to die of a known cause. That was my position then. That's my position now. But as um, you may know, when you're in a hospital a long time like that, they, the doctors want to talk to you about the do's and don'ts so that you can avoid being hospitalized again. But if you've got an undiagnosed illness, they really don't know what to tell you. So what they told me was, uh, Judge, we just suggest that you not get that again because it's likely to kill you. Okay. And... Uh, I got out of my chair, and I was just ready to walk out of their office when one of the doctors said to me, could we ask you one other question, Judge? And I said, certainly. What is it? They said, do you drink? Well, what kind of question is that? I'm a lawyer. Well, I used to be a lawyer. When I was a lawyer, I had to drink with clients. I had to drink with other lawyers. I had to drink with judges. Now that I'm a judge, i got to drink with other lawyers, and i got to drink with judges. Certainly I drink. It's a professional obligation that I drink. How much do you drink? Well, not too much. <laughs> Why do you ask? Well, we would like you to stop drinking for a while because uh, alcohol really does a number on your kidneys and your kidney function has just returned. And so we'd like you to maybe give your kidneys a rest, and then alcohol is really destructive for the liver. And, and then, uh, then of course, there's the pancreas, and nothing damages your pancreas like alcohol. So we'd like you to just not, you know, not drink for a while. How long? A year. Yeah, a year. Well, see, my last drink was on April the 7th. This is May 28th. I think I can do that. No, Judge, you don't understand. This is Memorial Day weekend, and we want you to not drink for a year from June the 1st. Now, I think there are people in this room right here who have already discerned the injustice that these doctors were trying to foist upon me. I was getting no credit for my seven weeks of continuous sobriety. And I want you to know I fought for those seven weeks. And I told him, I said, I'm not, I know, I haven't had a drink since April the 7th. And I, I won't, I won't, I won't agree to do this unless it's April the 7th. So we had a compromise. And the compromise was I would not drink until next April the 7th. And then on April the 7th, if I thought the pain and suffering and misery that I had just endured had anything at all to do with alcohol, then I would not drink until June the 1st. 
And so uh, with that agreement, I walked out of the Johns Hopkins Hospital and I walked into the most insane existence of my entire life. Not drinking and not changing. I got no program. Nobody said anything about being alcoholic or Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm just not drinking. Now, our book says, in the doctor's opinion, that when the alcoholic has alcohol taken away from him or her, we get restless, irritable, and discontent. Well, that was an understatement in my, in my case. I was pissed off in the spring-loaded position is what I was, and I was a very unhappy guy. And uh, I wasn't in that condition just for a couple of weeks or for a couple of months. I was in that condition for a couple of years. And what happens to people like us when we don't drink and we don't change is that we ultimately pick up a drink again. I mean, that's one of the, that's the, that's the nature of the disease. When, when my living in reality becomes so unbearable, I need a drink. I have earned a drink. I deserve a drink. And quite frankly, before I got to that hospitalization experience, I tried to stop drinking. You know, my dad was an alcoholic. He, he was, uh, you know, I know what alcoholic is. Now, I'm not going to be as bad as my father, that's for sure. I, but I, I've, I've sat with my head in my hands wondering if I have a problem with alcohol. I find out in Alcoholics Anonymous that the only people who ever wonder if they have a problem with alcohol are people who have a problem with alcohol. People who don't have a problem with alcohol, it never comes up. It just doesn't come up. So if you're here tonight wondering if you got a problem with alcohol or not, you're in the right place. That's for sure. But um, I did the not drinking and the not changing thing. Well, if I'm not going to pick up a drink, what am I, what's my choice then? Pick up a gun. The uh, sheriff in our community had shot himself to death in the basement of our courthouse. My uh, chambers were on the top floor of the courthouse. It seemed to me if I shot myself to death in the top floor of the courthouse, that would add symmetry to the building. That was my best thinking on the subject. You know, a permanent solution to a temporary problem. Well, I'm crazy. I am just crazy, I, and I don't know it, you see. Because I'm not drinking, therefore, I, by, by definition, I am not alcoholic. I may be a little bit on edge, okay? But it's just, I'm just, if you just leave me the hell alone, okay? Just mind your own damn business. Leave me alone, all right? Everything with me is fine. I'm doing fine, okay? I, I, okay, I may be a little edgy, all right? I may be a little irritable, but you'd be irritable too if you had to work with the people I got to work with and if you were married to the woman I was married with too. And those children, they, I'm telling you, I'm a little bit exasperated here. Leave me alone. I'm fine. Two friends of mine, Bob and Ken, were dedicated, active members of Alcoholics Anonymous. And they were watching me die of untreated alcoholism. They knew exactly what they were looking at. And Bob knew that my father had died with 15 years of continuous sobriety in this wonderful fellowship. And one day he came to me and he said, Jack, we have this book. We call it the big book in Alcoholics Anonymous. I was wondering if maybe you'd like to read it to find out about your father's disease. Clever guy, that, Bob. I think you know and I know that if he had said to me, Jack, we want you to read this book so you find out what's wrong with you, I wouldn't have read that book because there's nothing wrong with me. But I did read the book. And, not, and I was not surprised to find out my father is in that book. He's a real alcoholic as defined by that book. What really surprised me was I'm in that book. And I had not counted on that. I mean, I read, the, I read what was in the book and, I, and, and Bob and Ken had suggested to me that in reading the book, if I would just give some consideration to maybe if I had ever felt any of the feelings expressed in that book, if I'd ever thought any of the thoughts that were in that book, if I'd ever experienced any of the experiences that were related in that book, and of course, I had. I had. And so I was willing to concede possibly just maybe, maybe I had a very mild case of alcoholism, very mild, caught it just in time, um, 
no problem here, but yes, maybe I, maybe I am a very marginal alcoholic. And so Bob and Ken would come to my chambers every Friday at noontime, and they would bring their big books, and I had by that time acquired a big book. And we would sit and we would discuss the big book. We would read the big book. We would discuss what we'd re- they would read. They would explain to me the importance of what they had, of their understanding of what we had read. And then, of course, I would explain to them as Jack sees it. And as you might imagine, we had some very interesting intellectual discussions. Obviously, Bob and Ken knew something that I didn't know. They also knew that if I knew that they knew something that I didn't know, the very fact that they that I knew that they knew something that I didn't know, the very fact that I knew that they knew something that I didn't know would anger me, and I would be upset to know that they knew something that I didn't know that they knew that I didn't know, and I didn't know what it was that they knew that I didn't know. But when finding it out, I would be upset, and they knew that. But they were persistent and consistent in carrying the message of Alcoholics Anonymous to me because they knew that when there came a time that I actually knew what it was that they knew that they, that I didn't know that they knew that when I came to know what it was that they knew that I didn't know that I would no longer be upset knowing that they knew something that I didn't know because by that time I would know what it was that they knew that I didn't know and in Alcoholics Anonymous I find out that you know when you know that you know and not a moment before. Now, if you followed any of that, you're in the right place. If you found some of it to be the least bit confusing, you're still in the right place. It just means you don't know. They were encouraging me to go to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous, but I wasn't going to go in Hagerstown because Alcoholics Anonymous was having a tremendous membership growth under my leadership. As circuit court judge, I knew what to do with alcoholics. I sent them to Alcoholics Anonymous, and I surely wasn't going to go to meetings with those people. But I did start to go to meetings in uh, Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, just up the road from Hagerstown over in Frederick, Maryland, and down in Martinsburg, West Virginia. And I would arrive late, and I would leave early. But as some of you may know, not all meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous start on time. So there were occasions when I was actually present for the serenity prayer. But I was very good about getting out of there before that Lord's Prayer thing. And so now, it's December 22nd, 1989. Uh, the courthouse is closed because it's before Christmas. Uh, Ken and Bob and I, we have gone out to lunch. We can't have our big book meeting, but we went to lunch. We separated. I am now, I am now separated from my wife yet again. Um, when uh, when I was drinking, my wife and I were separated on three occasions, and on each occasion there were women involved. And uh, after I stopped drinking, my wife and I were separated on three occasions, and there were women involved. I think that's a lot. That's pretty clear evidence. I think that alcohol and drinking had nothing to do with any of those separations, but alcoholism had everything to do with all six of those separations. And we had no idea. We just didn't know. But I'm living in an apartment, and I got a girlfriend, and I got a backup girlfriend just in case the girlfriend leaves, and I got a special girlfriend for special occasions. And my wife objects to my girlfriends, and believe it or not, my girlfriends objected to my wife, and I was managing it all very well. And if you're looking for a delusional thought, that's a delusional thought. But that's what I told my sponsors, and they just smiled at me. Uh, we separated after lunch that day. I went back to my apartment, propped against my door. It was one of those Hickory Farms uh, packages that uh, you see only at Christmas time. Somebody had sent the judge a, a cheese log or a sausage. I was excited. I thought that was nice. I went into my apartment. There were a number of messages on my answering machine. I had plans for that night. It was a Friday. I had plans for Christmas. I had plans for New Year's. I had plans well into 1990. And uh, I'm trying to open this package, and as I'm trying to see how it's sealed, and I'm taking the messages off the answering machine, and I cut the tape to the package, I'm li- I lift the lid, and boom! You think that's funny, Pat? 
I, uh, a federal court judge had been killed in Birmingham, Alabama, ten weeks be- t- or ten days before by a package bomb that had been sent to his home. A lawyer in Savannah, Georgia, had been killed five days before by a package bomb that had been sent to his office. And I could smell the gunpowder, and I knew that I had opened a bomb. And uh, there was a fire, and I tried to put the fire out, and I couldn't. I went out in the hall, and I pulled the fire alarm. My neighbor came, said he had a fire extinguisher. I went back into the apartment, went to the phone to call 911. I pushed the, went to push the buttons on the phone, and that was when I first became aware that part of my right hand had been blown away. I uh, I finished that call to the 911, and I, I felt like somebody was pulling my pants off my hips. And when I looked down at the floor, I was standing in a puddle of blood, and it was just getting bigger and bigger and bigger while I was standing there, and I knew I was in serious trouble. And my neighbor came, and he asked if there was anything else he could do, and I asked him if he'd please get me a towel, and I opened my pants, and I did not have the courage to try to visualize the wound. But I put the towel where I thought I'd been injured, and I put my back against the wall, and I slid down on the floor. And it was pretty clear to me that I was going to die on that floor that afternoon. I could feel life draining away. And I was alone, and I was scared, and I was powerless. And the only thing of value that, that, that I had learned in my, um, my attendance at meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous was that I had learned the serenity prayer. And so I reached for the only tool I had. And I asked God to grant me the serenity to accept this thing which I couldn't change. To give me the courage to change what I could and the wisdom to know the difference. And I prayed that prayer 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 and I prayed that prayer. And I can't tell you whether it was the fifth, sixth, seventh, or eighth time that I prayed that prayer, but what I can tell you is God came. God came. I experienced a sense of peace and well-being, the likes of which I have never experienced before in my life, nor have I experienced it since. I didn't know if I was going to live or die on that floor. What I did know was that if I was to die on that floor, never to see our three children again and never to see my wife again, it would be all right. It would be all right. And if I lived, it would be all right. And if I died, it would be all right. And the firemen and the policemen came in, and they, my, both my eardrums had been blown out, and I really couldn't hear what they were saying. And... I stopped praying, and as soon as I stopped praying, this wave of fear swept upon me, and I told him, you guys do whatever you got to do. I'm going back to doing what I have to do, and I went back to the serenity prayer. And as soon as I did, that sense of peace and well-being returned. If you die, Jack, it'll be all right. And they cut all my clothes off of me and everything except for my red and green Christmas socks. They strapped me on a gurney. They took me down three floors. They took me out into the out into the street where our little uh, Hagerstown TV station was Johnny on the spot. They put me into the ambulance head first with my red and green Christmas socks sticking out the end of that ambulance, and uh, my red and green Christmas socks went round the world on CNN that night. And I went to the hospital, and they couldn't find my wife, and they couldn't find my girlfriend, but they found my sponsor, Ken, and they allowed him to come back to where I was being prepared for surgery. And uh, Ken... uh, Ken came and he held my hand and we prayed together and he prayed for me and they took me up to surgery and I don't know how shrapnel knows how to stop passing through flesh. I just don't know that. All I can tell you is that they took a rather significant piece of shrapnel out of my groin which was not resting against but was in close proximity to my femoral artery and I think we all know if my femoral artery had been nicked you'd have a different speaker here tonight. And they took me up to a recovery room after I'd been repaired surgically. And when I came to, my sponsor, Bob, was seated at the foot of my bed. And Bob was smiling. And let me say, parenthetically, it's really good to have a sponsor. If you're here tonight and you don't have a sponsor, you really need to get a sponsor. I mean, I know I'd rather do this myself, but let me just tell you, This has been hammered out on anvils of pain, and you don't have to experience the pain. Just get a sponsor. 
And the reason I say that is because sponsors see things differently. They have a different take on things. They really do. And what I'm about to share with you, you know, Bob is sitting there smiling. I said, Bob, what are you smiling at? He said, oh, not much, Jack. He said, I just, I think it must be wonderful to know that you cannot be harmed. I said, cannot be harmed? Somebody just tried to kill me. He said, oh, I know, Jack. He said, I I understand that package you opened contained four pipe bombs. He said, one pipe bomb is more than adequate to kill a human being. Two pipe bombs is really redundant. Three pipe bombs is around a bend. Four pipe bombs, Jack, he said, all I can say is you have really made somebody very angry. He said, man has done his very best to kill you, Jack. And the only explanation of your survival is the grace of God. You cannot be harmed. Your life has been spared for a purpose. It's good to have a sponsor. I wouldn't have come up with that in a million years. I said, oh, really, Bob? I said, and just what is the purpose for which my life has been spared? He said, oh, Jack, he said, I, I wouldn't presume to know what God's, God's purpose for you is. He said, but I can tell you this, it's God's will that you would be a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And that means you're going to have to pray that third step prayer with either Ken or I. You're going to have to do that four step inventory. You're going to have to do that fifth step with me or with Ken. You're going to have to make that six-step decision. You're going to have to pray that seven-step prayer. You're going to have to make that eight-step list. You're going to have to start making those amends so you can live successfully and usefully in 10, 11, and 12. Good to have a sponsor. I wouldn't have come up with that one either. I got out of the hospital on Christmas Day, 1989. It was the best Christmas I've ever had up to that point. I can stand here this evening and tell you that every succeeding Christmas thereafter has been better than the Christmas that preceded it. Christmas of 1990, my wife and I reconciled, and she and I have been together ever since. And like I said, it'll be 41 years come August if I don't screw this thing up. And that's not so much a testament to her or a testament to me, but that is a testament to the power of God. The power of God goes deep. Broken hearts are mended. Relationships are restored. The power of God is awesome. I got out of that hospital, and I did what had been suggested. I started to take action on this program of recovery called Alcoholics Anonymous. And I was, uh, I was struck by the fact that in the second chapter it says the problem for the alcoholic is not alcohol. Drinking is not my problem. Thinking is my problem. Simply how I think is my problem. S-H-I-T. Simply how I think is my problem. I am not good at it. I shouldn't be allowed to do it unsupervised. My very best thinking, the very best job that I was able to do thinking on my own was to get my sad ass into Alcoholics Anonymous. No, I'm not good at thinking. The problem for the alcoholics centers in the mind. My sponsor, Bob, uh, moved from uh, Hagerstown to Tampa, Florida about 10 years ago. I still consider him to be my sponsor, although we don't see each other frequently. I do speak with him. My sponsor, Ken, on the other hand, I see him frequently. But Ken and Bob were both in Hagerstown at the time, and we launched out on this course of vigorous action. And... I came across this pamphlet that says alcohol is, is, is AA for you. And, and I don't know, I don't know if this applies to you or not, but have you ever decided to stop thinking for a week or so but only lasted for a couple of days? Do you wish people would mind their own business about your thinking and stop telling you what to do? Do you envy people who seem to be able to think without getting into trouble? Have you had problems connected with your thinking during the past year? Has your thinking caused trouble at home? Do you tell yourself that you can stop thinking anytime you want to, even though you keep thinking when you don't mean to? Have you missed days of work or school because of your thinking? Have you ever felt that your life would be better if you just did not think? Well, 
you know, I thought, I, I believed, I thought, there's a, there's a problem word, thought. I thought this was an internet, intellectual exercise. And, and I'm a smart guy. Let me tell you, I told Ken and Bob, I said, look guys, I might have spent five years in high school, but I got out of college in four years with a bachelor's degree, and I graduated law school with honors. And I, I wanted to impress that, that with that, them with that. And we were in my chambers, my judge's office, when I was sharing that with them. And Ken told me that there are degrees on rectal thermometers, judge, and you know what we do with them. I thought that was a little harsh, quite frankly. I mean, we were in my office, for crying out loud. But what they had was the courage to tell me the truth. They cared enough about me to tell me the truth. This is not something that I could think my way out of. I grew up and I was told somewhere along the line I learned this. I don't know. I just learned it. If you put your mind to it, you can figure it out. You know, just just think your way through this thing, man. Slow down. Take it easy. Think your way through it. Now, that works in a lot of areas of my life, and it worked quite well, but it didn't work with alcoholism. And I find out that what I have to do is I have to live my way into right thinking, and I have to take action on this program. And I had this little problem with God. I was upset with God. I was angry with God. I was one of those people that bristled with antagonism towards God. And Bob uh, knew my dad died with 15 years sobriety in this program. He said, uh, tell me what your problem is, Jack. I said, well, when I, you know, when I was 14, I had prayed that my father would stop drinking, and he said he was going to stop drinking, and I thought that was great, and the next day he got drunk. And I didn't want to have anything to do with a God who would pay fast and loose with the lives of, of my mom and my sister and me. And so I closed the door on God. In fact, I remember back in that, at that time, Fats Domino had a song. Didn't, didn't sell a lot of them, but maybe some of you remember it was called, I'm going to be a wheel someday. You know? I'm going to be somebody. And, I, and that's what I did. I set out to do it on my own. And he said, well, how old was your dad when he stopped drinking? I said, I was 26. He said, Jack, he said, did you ever consider what 12 years means to infinite God? It's good to have a sponsor. I never thought of that. He said, 12 years is a nanosecond. It's an infinitesimal period of time to infinite God. It's nothing. He said, you got really quick service. What is your complaint? Well, the God of my understanding was the God of the church I grew up in. It was a wrathful, punishing, vengeful God, and I didn't want to have anything to do with him. And Bob said, what kind of God would you like? I said, I'd like to have a loving, caring, forgiving, gracious God who only wants the best for me. He said, you can have that, Jack. But you can only have that if you take action on these steps. So I had to take action on the steps. You know, in our fourth chapter, it talks about the nine bedevilments. It says we're having trouble with personal relationships. I believe I mentioned my girlfriend, my backup girlfriend, my girlfriend on the side, and my wife. So I had problems with relationships. Couldn't control my emotional nature. I believe I mentioned I was pissed off in a spring-loaded position. I qualified. Pray to misery. Pray to depression. Couldn't make a living. I said, oh, now that one doesn't apply to me because I get paid a lot of money to be a circuit court judge. And Bob pointed out to me that I was spending money I didn't have to buy stuff I didn't want to need to impress a bunch of people I didn't like. I'd never heard that before. I heard a lot in Alcoholics Anonymous. I never heard it before. He said, anytime you spend more money than you make, Jack, you're having a problem making a living. Oh, okay. All right. Feeling of usually full of fear. Full of fear. No, not me. Hey, I told you, I was a cop. I was a state senator. I was a prosecutor. I was a circuit court judge. I'm not afraid of anything. How about snakes? What kind of snakes? Rattlesnakes. Okay. How about spiders? What kind of spiders? Black widow spiders. How about fear of failure? How about fear of success? How about fear of commitment? How about Fear of being found out. When you go back home to your home group, slip up behind somebody and whisper in their ear, they know, and walk away. Gives me the whim-whams up here just thinking about it.
yeah, okay, I'm a fearful guy. I had no idea how fear-based I was. I really didn't. And I find out here that these nine bedevilments, it says we have a solution to them. You know, it says in the 12 and 12 that these steps which are spiritual in nature or practices a way of life will remove the obsession to drink. That is a good thing. But more importantly than removing the obsession to drink, it will render the sufferer, that's me, will render the sufferer happily and usefully whole. And I had no idea that that was what I was searching for all my life. That's what I was searching for in the bottle. That's what those first drinks did for me. They made me feel as if I were happily and usefully whole. And what I found out here in Alcoholics Anonymous is this design for living is such that when I take action on these steps and get the experience of taking action on these steps, and my life becomes so infinitely better than it's ever been before, how and why would I ever want to mess it up by ingesting something that would alter my mood and my mind? I've got way too much to lose now. When I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, I wanted to shoot myself. I had nothing to lose. And now I get to live, live happy, joyous, and free on a daily basis. And my experience is it's going to get better. And if you just come to me on January the 1st and said, Jack, can 2007 be better than 2006? I would tell you no. 2006 is the best year I have ever had. And here we are in May of 2007, and it's already better than 2006. How does that happen? I don't know how that happens. I just don't know. I just know that it does happen. I did not come here from Hagerstown, Maryland, to spend the evening with you in this hot gymnasium to tell you lies. I came here to tell you truth. You don't have to believe anything I say, but it is true. I didn't like some of the things I read in the big book, but the big book does not lie. The big book is true. The big book was written before I was born. It was written before many of you in this room were born. How could they know so much about me in a book that was written before I became into existence? How can there be so much creation without a creator? How can there be so much organization without an organizer? I have to believe that there is a power greater than myself. I don't have to believe in the church I grew up in. I don't have to believe in your God. You don't have to believe in my God. But there is too much immutable evidence to be denied, even by a knucklehead like me. And our book says, if I'm just willing to try, that upon that slender reed, a tremendous spiritual life can be built. And that is my experience. I have had so many good things happen to me in Alcoholics Anonymous. I was out in um, Akron for Founders Day. And if you've been to Akron on Founders Day, uh, I was staying in the dormitory. And uh, when uh, they, uh, they, they, you go down to the gang lavatory in those days. And if you didn't get there early, the thing would be trashed. So I went down there. It was on a Sunday morning. I was the first guy in there. I was showering and shaving. A guy comes in. He says, hi, I'm Woody from Baltimore, Maryland. I said, hi, Woody. I'm Jack from Hagerstown, Maryland. He says, oh, I go to Hagerstown all the time. I thought, I wonder, he's probably a truck driver or something. I said, what do you come to Hagerstown for, Woody? He says, well, me and my sponsor, we bring a meeting up to the prison there in Hagerstown. Um, We do that once a month. I said, I'm embarrassed, Woody. I live 10 minutes from that prison. I don't know a single person that takes a meeting in there. He said, would you like to go with us? Uh, Woody, I'd really like to talk to you about that, but i got to get back to my room to meet my roomie, and uh, you know we're going to breakfast and everything, so I'll talk with you about that later. I went back to my room. I told Glenn what had happened. He said, did you give me your phone number? I said, no, I didn't. He says, Jack, there are 15,000 people here. He'll never find you. I took comfort in that. Now, in that, uh, in that dining hall, when, they, when you go down eight buffet lines and get your food, then they tell you where to sit. And you just fill up, fill up, fill up, fill up, fill up, fill up. And then they shoot people down the other side of the table. Now, we had already had three meals there on Saturday. So part of the fun was, I, gee, I wonder who's going to sit across from me. Yeah. Woody. Not to my right and not to my left, but right in the chair right in front of me. 
As a retired circuit court judge, the last thing I want to do is take meetings into a prison. But I understand God when he moves. And I understand what Alcoholics Anonymous is about. Not doing what I want to do is doing the things I don't want to do. And so I began taking meetings into prisons. And the first meeting I went to, the guy who was chairing the meeting I'd put in prison. He hadn't gotten over it. He had a resentment. Second meeting I went to, the guy who was sitting next to me I'd put in prison. But he'd gotten paroled and then put himself back in prison, so he wasn't nearly as mad at me. And I sponsor guys. I got a guy who just got out of prison up in Maine who I've been sponsoring. And I sponsor a guy over in Delaware who got out last year. And he's CPC chair in Delaware this year. And they're doing the deal and their lives are changing. And one day, a really cold day in Hagerstown, I was, um, I was reading a legal newspaper and it said, Be a lawyer in paradise. The Republic of Palau, which is an island nation in the western Pacific, two hours southwest of Guam, was looking for assistance attorneys general. So I sent him a resume. I went home. My wife said, anything interesting happened at the office today? I said, no, I applied for a job in Palau, but that's about it. She said, where's Palau? I said, I don't know, but it's warmer than it is here. I'll make a long story short. Uh, eventually, I got offered not the job as assistant attorney general for the Republic of Palau. I was offered the job of attorney general of Republic of Palau. Now, you might ask yourself, how does an alcoholic judge from Western Maryland become the attorney general of a country? Well, in my case, I answered a newspaper ad. I don't know how it's going to work out for you. So I called New York, and I asked him, do we have meetings in Palau? They said, no. They said, we got meetings in Guam. It's two hours by jet. That's a little past going to any length, so they sent me a starter kit. And I went off to Palau with my starter kit, but I was there about 72 hours, and I found out there was a guy there named Bill, Bill Periclear, who's my good friend, and uh, he might know something about alcoholics and drug addicts. So when I called him up for my first telephone call as attorney general, I called this guy. I said, do you have meetings? Are you a friend of Bill W.'s? He said, yes. I said, do we have meetings here? He said, yes, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays at the National Hospital. There's one tonight at 730 I said, you didn't tell New York. He said, I didn't know I had to tell New York. I said, well, you don't have to tell them, but they're interested in this sort of thing. He said, well, he said, why don't you come up tonight? I said, I will. So now I'm going back to getting ready to go to my first meeting in a new country. And you know when you're going to your first meetings, any place, new town, new country, it doesn't make any difference. You want to dress right. You want to make a nice impression. So I got all my uh, AA shirts laid out on my bed. I'm trying to pick the right shirt. There's this black shirt. That says, first things first on it. Now, you don't wear black in a tropical climate. You just don't. You wear white. So I'm looking at my white shirts, but my black shirt is going, wear me, wear me, wear me. All right, so I put the daggone thing on, and I went up to the National Hospital, and I found the, I found the meeting. There were four Americans there and three Palauans, and they welcomed me to the first things first group of Karor Palau. I love it when God does a bank shot just to let me know that he's around. Now, I stand before you tonight as the deposed Attorney General of the Republic of Palau. Yes, they threw me out of the country. In my own defense, I think I should tell you that I arrested a deputy chief of the National Police Force and charged him with a few alcohol and methamphetamine-related offenses. And he was the lifelong friend of the president and his personal appointee to the position. But I think I would have survived that. But a couple weeks after that, I arrested my immediate superior, the minister of justice, and charged him with conspiracy to traffic and drugs and obstruction of justice. And he, too, was a lifelong friend of the president and and his appointee. So uh, my wife and I were invited to return to Maryland, and uh, we accepted that invitation. Uh, because this is the kind of place when they put that cook pot into the square and they start chipping carrots and potatoes into it and say, we'd like to have you for dinner. They mean it. <laughs> the longer I'm in Alcoholics Anonymous, I find out the less I know. I mean, I know I'm to grow in effectiveness and I am to grow in understanding. I mean, that's in living 10, 11, and 12, I know that's what the book says and that's my experience. I know... I'm to fit myself to be of maximum service to God and to my fellow man. 
I know that is, that is my purpose in being. I always wanted to know why was I created? Why was I born? Why was I here? Why wasn't I killed? Why didn't I die? In all those occasions that I placed myself in harm's way and I find out in Alcoholics Anonymous is to fit myself to be of maximum service to God and to my fellow man. But here's something that I do know with absolute certainty. Absolute certainty. I know that I'm here tonight as the result, the direct result of prayer. My mom, who doesn't think I'm an alcoholic, thought I was crazy. God, please help my son. I know my wife prayed. I know my three children prayed. I know other people prayed. I'm a here as a direct result of prayer. Here's something else that I know. I know that every single human being that's in this room tonight who's alcoholic is here as the result of prayer. I really don't care if you like it or not. I don't care if you believe it or not. It doesn't make any difference. AA doesn't care whether you like it or not. AA doesn't care if you believe it or not. It's just true. Every single one of us is here as a result of prayer. Now, if you don't like that one and you don't believe that one, check this one out. This group of people assembled here this evening have never been assembled before in the history of the world. And we will never be assembled together again. And in our book it says there is one who has all power. That one is God. May you find him now. Right here. Right now. God is not in yesterday, and God is not in tomorrow, but God is here, right here, right now. If you're new here, you're just starting out here, or you're just coming back here, stay here. It is not by accident that you are in this room tonight. Think of all the twists and turns that your life had to take to place you here at this moment in time. And consider, if you will, the twists and turns that my life had to take to bring me here to be here at this moment in time. I can assure you that last year on May the 5th, it was not my intention or plan to be in Grand Isle, Louisiana on April or May the 5th, 2007. It is not by accident that we are here. It is not by accident that we are assembled here. If you are been in Alcoholics Anonymous for a while and you're sober and you don't have a sponsor and you're doing the I sponsor myself deal, the ism of alcoholism, get a sponsor. If you're here tonight and you're not happy, joyous, and free, get together with your sponsor and talk to him or her about what it is that you are doing that you should not be doing or what is it that you're not doing that you should be doing because our book says that this program is designed to render each and every one of us happy, joyous, and free. It is not a sometime thing for some of us. It's an all-time thing for all of us if we are willing to work for it. Ordinarily, at, one, at these deals, I have a pamphlet with me. It's called A Member's Eye View of Alcoholics Anonymous. I hope you're familiar with it. If you're not, get your home group to order it. But at the end of that pamphlet, the uh, author of it says that uh, he refers to when Jesus was in the prison of Herod and John the Baptist wanted to know if, or no, John the Baptist was in the prison of Herod and wanted to know if his cousin Jesus was the Messiah or not. And he sent two of his disciples to ask if he was. And Jesus answered as he often did. He didn't really answer to direct it. He said, just tell him what you've seen, that the blind see and the deaf hear and, the, and those who are afflicted are healed. A number of years ago, two men, Ken and Bob, maneuvered me into Alcoholics Anonymous. I didn't want to be here. But I have learned here that the dead are raised here, the deaf hear here, the blind see here, and God grant that it shall always be so. My name is Jack. I am an alcoholic. My sobriety date is April the 7th, 1982.